welcome to another old steam powered machine shop. Well, we don't have any steam at all down here at the southern hideout where I will be for another month and a half, two months. Uh, but we're doing a little planning on the upcoming season and uh, I sort of wanted to call you all to a company meeting here of the channel. Uh, last uh, video had quite a small viewer turnout, but it had the most comments of any video I've ever put up and also the most likes. So you guys are it. And uh, I've got some shop news for you. The weather up home is pretty lousy. In fact, they've had a particular amount of problems with the little railroad that runs through our town. It's a uh, branch line, got a few customers. And the snow has gotten so deep that they just, they just had some real problems with it. <laughs> so, the thing I want to talk to you about is, um, a planer. I've been talking about a planer. I would like to have a planer in my shop. Well, for obvious reasons, it would be really neat to have a planer that would handle real big work and all of that. But even more than that, uh, you know, a planer was a, a standard piece of equipment in all real machine shops in the old days. And uh, it was probably the biggest machine in the shop, the most impressive. And uh, they've gone away, and there's literally nothing that you can find about planers and planer work. I mean, I, one night I even tried. I was on the internet searching for a video of a planer working, a good sized planer working, doing something. And there just isn't anything. There's a couple videos, you know, in their museums, and uh, uh, there are small planers that are just doing, making chips and all that. So I'd like to have a planer in the shop to pass on some of the historical aspects of the machine, how it works, how it's set up, what you can do with it, what it's like for it to run. I mean, you know, here you've got this huge table, 12 feet long, reciprocating back and forth under a cutter with flat belts, one forward and one backwards, and it's just jumping from one belt over to the other. And your first image in your mind is of squealing and squawking and all kinds of jumping around and jerky motion, but it isn't. It's just beautiful to watch. So anyway, uh, I told you in some of my earlier videos, I found this pointer and I, you know, I want to thank all the viewers for, for sending me tips on planers that they, they found. Uh, and I checked several of them out, but they were like way, way, way far away or whatever. Anyway, this one in Delaware just wouldn't go away. It's, it's a big planer. It's got a uh, eight foot bed on it. It probably weighs 7,800 pounds. And it's in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and the owner has been talking to me, and he came down on the price that way below scrap value. And this is a machine that's set up and working in their shop. There's nothing wrong with it, probably, other than some minor adjusting, whatever. And it has the overhead shaft, and there, there's a big motor involved with it that they, they run it with. So... <clears throat> I decided to buy it. Uh, so now the problem is, how do you get the thing home? Uh, I have some contacts with uh, riggers, and I've gotten some estimates from the riggers. And it's going to be several thousand dollars to get the thing back home. And here's your chance to help this channel out. In, f in fact, I even had one viewer that offered uh, a substantial contribution to help get the thing home. Anyway, what I'm really looking for is 
Uh, if anybody knows any riggers or any haulers that could haul this, uh, the rigger that I, one of the riggers I talked with will split it up into a loading phase or a hauling, and a hauling phase and an unloading phase. Well, I can get it unloaded, uh, but I really need somebody to haul it or a rigger that would do the whole job or somebody that knows a rigger that will do the whole job. So uh, it's got to go from Wilmington to near Binghamton, New York. Uh, little town of Newark Valley. Um, so anyway, that's the big news. Uh, my G Plus page is going to come down in another month or so. Google is doing away with G Plus. And uh, it's really too bad because that worked out really well for me. I, I, there's 560 of you on there that follow that page regularly. And uh, I guess the G Plus page was a flop as far as Google is concerned, they're looking for something that is a little more profitable and so they're, they're taking it down. I may put something up on something else, uh, like Tumblr or, uh, uh, and I don't, it probably won't be Instagram or uh, Facebook, but it'll be something. Um, so anyway, I got some clips that I took this summer about the boiler and uh, uh, things that you might be interested in and uh, also getting started on this governor for the next engine uh, uh, steam engine overhaul. So thanks again for your support and uh, we'll talk to you later. Another point of interest here with boilers, this is called the blowdown valve. It's at the lowest point of the boiler and it's typically a drain, but it's also used to minimize the amount of minerals and other bad stuff that concentrate in here. As the steam is being generated and the water is being used out of here, that stuff stays behind and it, it concentrates it so that uh, it sometimes can form scale on the inside of the boiler uh, shell and make it steam hard and it's also dangerous on top of the on top of the uh, uh, crown sheet here where the flues start up because the hot fire is against that steel plate and the water is 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 protecting it on top and if there's scale here it insulates the water from the steel and the steel runs much much hotter and it can lead to some real real problems and, and eventual boil or failure if it's totally ignored. So what you do is once a day or so uh, when the water is down pretty well and you're about to put some in it, you open this valve up really quick and you blow maybe 10 or 15 gallons of water out of the boiler and this pipe goes through the wall and out onto my concrete ramp out here and you have to be careful that nobody's walking by when you're doing this so they'll get a bath. Um, but what, and then you put water in on top of that and if you do that regularly it keeps the amount of uh, minerals and uh, dissolved uh, bad things uh, low. And then of course every so often you should drain the boiler completely and refill it. Another thing we found uh, through modern technology is that boilers are 
very subject to corrosion if the pH of the water is not right. And it's been found that the pH needs to be run up to about 9 or a little higher to make the water sort of inert against the metal. Uh, another thing is that when the boiler is steamed, the oxygen comes out of it and it's the oxygen that does most of the damage. So uh, if you're steaming the boiler regularly, like every day or a couple times a week, it's fine. The oxygen doesn't have time to get back into the boiler. But if, you, if it's going to set for a week or more, the boiler really needs to be drained and dried to keep any corrosion from happening. Well, that's not real convenient to do. So, another thing you can do is you can put in uh, what's called a nit uh, yeah, nitrogen blanket. Uh, nitrogen is quite heavy and it lays on top of the uh, water level and won't allow the oxygen to go back into the water. So, if I'm not going to fire this boiler uh, for a while, I have a tank down here. And this is nitrogen. And that's what this fitting is for. I just actually, this is a quick change fitting going into the boiler. I use it to, to, uh, pressurize the boiler with compressed air for checking it and doing other things but it also I put this hose on here and I'll put set the regulator up to about oh maybe 10 psi and when the boiler has cooled down uh, I'll run the nitrogen until it just starts to come up on the gauge just a little bit and then shut this valve off and turn off the nitrogen and that puts a blanket of nitrogen in there that keeps the oxygen from going into the water and rusting the boiler. And you can really see it in the uh, boiler drain water. Here's a quick little side note for you. I know most of you that watch this channel have got home shops yourself and you may run into this. I bought this drill press a couple years ago because I needed a drill press down here to mess around with and I didn't want to buy a real cheap Chinese drill press so I took a chance and I found this on Craigslist and it turned out to be a 1947 model Delta Milwaukee uh, I mean you know you pay you pay your money and take your chances I mean the thing was in a barn there was no electricity out there there's no way to test it out the guy said the motor ran okay I took it home it turned out to be a really nice old drill press. This table has got hardly any marks in it. It's been broken here somehow, probably tipped over or something. Somebody did a really nice job of brazing it up. Anyway, everything works good except the chuck was really abused and worn and stuck. And uh, it's a Jacobs 6A and I figured I was dreading the trying to pull it off of there because I figured I was going to really have a problem. So finally one day I said well that's enough of that so we're going to get a new chuck for this. So the chuck's on here and trying to figure out whether it was screwed on or tapered on or what the taper was there was almost no information available. Nothing in the, in the Delta manual will tell you anything about how to replace the chuck. They show a complete spindle with chuck or a complete spindle that has a Morris taper with a chuck uh, on these models. And <clears throat> I didn't have a wedge so I modified a pickle fork here for doing ball joints which went in and it, it wouldn't pull it. It wouldn't take it off but it started pulling the shaft out of the quill. So I called everybody. I emailed everybody, I talked to a lot of people, and nobody knew how this was. 
and it was deceptive because there's a collar in here that is way bigger than any taper size I could find in the book. So I didn't know what I was up against. So anyway, I finally figured out that you can pull this whole shaft out by loosening up this. There's a collar up here with a set screw and this whole three quarter inch diameter shaft pulls out of the pulley up here. And the delta is pretty cool because the pulley arrangement is mounted in its own bearings and it won't fall apart when you pull the shaft out. It's meant to be able to replace the shaft. There's a long key that runs in the shaft. So you pull this whole shaft out, now you got the chuck on the end of it and you can knock the chuck off. And in this case, uh, there was no hole all the way through. So I drilled one and <clears throat> I drilled one that was a little bigger than a quarter of an inch and it drills very easy and it was very thin. It was only like an eighth of an inch and it dropped down into a little, you know, void there between the end of the shaft and the rest of the chuck. So then I could put it in the vise here and with a uh, drift, I knocked the shaft out. Shaft was in perfect shape, put it back in and determined that it was the most common taper for a Jacobs chuck there is a 33 JT. You can buy those chucks all day long. I didn't have a lot of money invested in this and I didn't I'm looking at Jacobs chucks and Albright chucks and they're in a hundred to two hundred dollar price range plus shipping and everything so I figured what the heck so I found this Chinese chuck for a little over 25 bucks and I'm telling you it comes with a, a number three Morris taper uh, arbor which knocks out really easy. This has got a hole all the way through so this just comes out so you got this and it's a 33 taper and it goes right on there just like nothing. So now it's a Delta Walkie Chicano drill press. This is an uh, inch and a half size picker and governor off the Lily engine that I'm going to restore. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to take this governor apart and store it while I'm down here in Florida. I did one two years ago, very similar to this, uh, in video number 20. And you can check it if you'd like to go back and look. Uh, this governor has got a few things different about it. It doesn't have the automatic stop deal with the weighted uh, idler. And it's got a worm screw type adjustment on this spring here. And if you go back in the Google patents, you'll find uh, a patent for that uh, in 1906. I cleaned up the bands here where it normally just has the uh, speed of the governor. And this one says shaft revolutions 350 and there's the serial number of the governor. But over here it's got the patents listed and it has, they're all 1906 patents. So uh, a year later, 1907, the Ball Ranger adjustment was invented and patented by Pickering and also the uh, auto stop thing. So this has got to be, the only year this could be really is 1906. So that's how I'm figuring it. And on this one, <clears throat> to adjust the speed, you can make fine adjustments with this worm drive which tightens up this spring here. But your main adjustment is with this knob here, which has the effect of lengthening and shortening the rod uh, that goes down into the valve. 
So I'm going to start taking this thing apart and I'll get back to you. This is the valve. It's a double valve. The steam works uh, from the inside out so that there's no real force. It balances and there's no force on the valve when it, the rod tries to open or close it. It's got two seats down there. They're brass sleeves. And this fits tight, not tight, just a slip fit down in those brass rings. Tapered pin. Uh, let's see, that should come out. That spring engages in that little recess right there. And this is the worn gear that this runs on. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that looks like it's bent. why it's not wanting to come out of there. I'm going to clean this up a little with sandpaper and that should slide right out. Yeah. Now you can see how this particular version of the governor works. It's got a, a slotted yoke here 
that this long shaft, long rod fits into, and it should, and it is out of it, okay. So all I gotta do is get this pin out of there. That should drop right out. taper pin. A lot of different sizes. Alright, now this should come out of there, but why doesn't it? After I knocked this uh, taper pin out, I heated this just a little bit with a torch, because this has got to be a pretty tight fit in there. They don't want it to work loose, and uh, it pulled right out then. This is the part that this engages in. It's the part that that engages in. Clean that up a little bit before I try to pull that up on there.
Well, one thing I've noticed is that this gear is made quite a bit lighter, thinner <clears throat> on the older version. Something that I noticed right here is this is the packing gland nut and the packing in this uh, seals around the valve rod and the valve rod has to move up and down without any friction hardly at all or the governor won't work right. So you can't just crank down on this thing really tight. So <clears throat> they put a groove around the nut and there's a wire here that probably was a like a safety wire type of deal. It's very hard wire. And that had extra wire out here that probably went around here and twisted so that you could turn the nut but it wouldn't let the nut unscrew because the nut's not very tight. 